We live in a world of matter, all the things we can see and touch. But the best theory of reality physicists have only explains a tiny amount, 4% of our observable universe. At Italy's National Institute of Nuclear Physics, scientists are launching an experiment to discover the rest, including so-called dark matter. It's an uncertain road to unlocking the secrets of the universe. And this is where it begins, with a particle accelerator and a theory. We are trying to have a link in between this huge hidden world to our small known world. Is it fair to call this the bridge between the seen and the unseen? It could be, yes. So how do scientists even know to look for something that they cannot see? Well, after studying galaxies, they believe that there's a force much stronger than gravity holding those galaxies and all the star systems within them together. A dark force. Now up and running, the experiment will last for several months. If successful, it could create an entirely new realm of physics as they begin the hunt for a side of reality hidden from view. One thing that Hume said that I do agree with is that he says evolution is deceptively simple yet utterly profound in its implications. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with it. Because as John Stone Street noted, he says, ideas have consequences, bad ideas have victims. You see, the evolutionary hypothesis has a, a lot of victims. If indeed life is an accident without meaning, without design, survival is the fate of only the fittest, then the most brutal, opportunistic, and predatorial amongst us are the ones who succeed. If the true nature of the world we live in is, as Tennyson wrote, red in tooth and claw, then there are no morals, there are no ethics, right and wrong does not exist, good and evil does not exist, truth and falsehood, even the laws that try to govern and enforce those principles have no force or no purpose, they have no place and they have no meaning. That even simple human kindnesses become valueless. Love and the sacrifice that it often produces is merely an illusion and at worst a cruel deception. And you see, when you raise a generation of young people with this kind of tripe, as Hume notes, the implications are utterly profound. Uncovering the world of dark particles could be the key to understanding the nature of matter, gravity, and what is holding the universe together. But after decades of research, scientists have yet to find direct evidence of what some call the dark sector, where an unknown matter exhibits gravitational force but cannot otherwise be detected. It is one of the biggest mysteries in physics, and though invisible, the dark sector is believed to make up about 96% of the universe and the billions of galaxies within it. This is a headline from The Guardian in their particle physics section. Scientists hunt mysterious dark force to explain a hidden realm of the cosmos. That was a recent headline. This is Hen Mackey. She says, I studied humanities and social sciences, so I don't know what dark matter actually is, but I like what it represents, an invisible force that affects every nanosecond of our lives while we go about blindly unaware of its existence. It affects all of us and we just don't know or care enough. Yeah, so dark matter, really played this crucial role in the story of our universe, um, as it makes up most of, as they correctly said, most of the matter in the universe. Um, it means that, uh, a, a less consequential thing is that it means that every picture that we see of a, of a galaxy is a little bit distorted. As Katie said, the presence of the dark matter um, distorts the light that we see. Yeah, I think invisible matter is a great way to put it. We have a lot of ways of seeing that there has to be some extra matter there because we see the effects of its gravity in a lot of different places on on small scales at galaxies and large scales um, for the whole universe but we just don't know what it's made of so it's it's some kind of invisible stuff it has lots of different effects it changes the the whole large scale structure of the universe how galaxies and clusters of galaxies come together but we can't see it directly we can only see 
that you know there's there's something weird going on in the things that we can see. They're moving in strange ways. Um, it's even bending the shape of space itself. Uh, but we just need to figure out what it is. There Absolutely. are multiple observations that tell us that there is this missing mass that is dark matter. It isn't you know something speculative. This is this is something that is making up most of the matter in our universe. That may suggest that the dark matter may not actually be a particle and may actually force us to even um, revisit the very foundations of physics itself. I want to begin by saying that something that everybody's uh, in here is familiar with. We all know that when it comes to explaining the material universe of which we are a part of, that there are two basic competing views as to how it all came into existence. Um, there's the evolutionary hypothesis, and uh, which posits that all things, including human life, are the result of spontaneous generation, which is a term that means that you have nothing and all of a sudden out of nothing comes something. And as a result, we have, live in a world where everything is inherited, it's natural, it's a, a random selection process without a design, without a designer. Then in other words, everything came from nothing and somehow it all coalesced together to make everything that is. Now, there's so many problems with this view, and it's ironic because many times people don't like to address them or they talk as if there are any problems. I mean, if you begin with the very fact of spontaneous generation, there's absolutely not a single example or evidence that we could point to anything coming, be, being nothing and then suddenly spontaneously becoming something. People often ask questions like, well, where did God come from? Well, there's an even more important question. If you're an evolutionist, where did anything come from? And the problem is, it's easier to say God, this almighty being, created everything and spoke into existence. That's more plausible to say, well, there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was something. That's a huge, huge philosophical barrier and that's why you find that evolutionists rarely want to have conversations about original causes. They rarely want to talk about origins because they know that they have absolutely says, well, it all was. But even you go beyond it, I mean, you talk about the fossil record, which does not support the premise of any kind of progressive change, or DNA and chemicals, which requires a, a, a designer. You, DNA is a, a coded system, it's like a language, and it has to have somebody who put that together for it to make any sense at all. Harit says if we can have dark matter all around us and we can't properly quantify it, does it mean it's possible for there to be an alternate reality or a parallel universe without ever being aware it's there at all? So I think we got an answer to that, but Moto, here as we move on, I want you to talk about this, because Yusuf here says, this is nonsense, which upon investigation yields little for the well-being of humanity. Come on, AJ Stream, stick to culture and geopolitical social affairs and leave the hard, quote-unquote, sciences to others. <laughs> Moto, this is your life's work. Why does it matter? It does matter, because if you think to it, we just know very few of what the universe is made of, because we are just less than 20% of the matter which is around the universe. So this does mean that we think to know a lot, but really we know nothing about what the universe is made of. And this is, uh, of course, a challenge that we have to, to pursue, because we cannot stay there not knowing why all the galaxies are the form we observe. We cannot know, stay there without knowing why our galaxy has the form that we observe. And we, if we don't understand what dark matter is, we will never understand what we observe in the universe which is way very, very important for humanity, I think.
And within that, that the universe did not come into being through a Big Bang, which, I mean, the idea of a Big Bang has a number of problems, aside from the fact that there's no evidence of any great Big Bang. But I always ask the question, you know, where did the combustibles come from, first of all? Secondly, who lit, who lit the fuse? And thirdly, when is the last time you've seen an explosion create something? Usually it has the opposite effect, and it goes on and on from there with many, many other questions. But what often gets overlooked in this discussion or this scientific argument is the effect that these two diametrically opposed views have upon how we see ourselves and we see our place in the world. <coughs> For example, if evolution is true, then according to Richard Dawkins, a well-known atheist and, and evolutionary biologist who wrote, uh, amongst other things, the book called The God Delusion, he makes this amazing statement, very honest, very transparent. He says, life has no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. I mean... If you believe that lie, the world that you live in is nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, and then you say, so have a nice day. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> there's something inherently within us that kind of rejects that. We just, it's like, it's, it's beyond being able to bear. In fact, but he's not alone. Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Edward Humes, uh, another Darwinian uh, uh, atheist, said, Darwin's brilliance, he wrote, was in seeing beyond the appearance of design and understanding the purposeless, merciless process of natural selection and how it culled all but the most successful org organisms from the tree of life, thereby creating the illusion that a master intellect had designed the world but close inspection of the watch-like perfection of the honeybee's comb and the ant trails reveals that they are products of random, repetitive, unconscious behaviors, not conscious designs. Now, I don't know if you followed that, and you probably didn't because it's the most the biggest pile of double-speak and gobbledygook I've ever heard in my life. He's basically saying we look at the universe and we see this incredible watch-like design. In other words, we look at the intricacy of a handmade watch with all of its parts and pieces and we're amazed by the precision that brings all of that together to make it work so effectively. And we look at the universe and we see that same kind of amazing craftsmanship and purposeless, but on closer examination, we realize it's just an illusion. It's just an appearance. Actually, it's random chaos. And I don't say, how did you get there? I don't look at my watch and say, random chaos, obviously. I look at my watch and I have to conclude, there was a watchmaker. And that's where we begin to realize that there is an, a, 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 a way of trying to rationalize what you want because what you're really working towards is not a scientific explanation, but rather a world view that allows you to do what you want the way you want to do it. Now, in contrast to that, there is the other view, which is our view, or my view at least, the biblical view, that in Genesis 1 it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then chapter, verse 10 he goes on to say, and it was good. Two very important things to cite, because first of all, God created, and the God who created was a good God. He did it for good purposes. And basically this view posits that everything is a direct consequence of a design design, a divine design by a good and beneficent God whose purpose was to bless us and to benefit us by the graces and the goodnesses that he could show to us. But what the Bible tells us is that there was this creative moment when God said, let there be light. And what light is, is energy, that God released powerful energy that brought light or, and with it life into the universe as we know it. That he animated the matter which he had previously created to end up creating everything that we see around us. Talk about dark matter as if you're having coffee with a friend. And this is what she came up with. Dark matter is really a name we give as a proxy to indicate 
stuff that we don't know what it is, really. It's just to say there's something out there, we can't see it, but we can tell it's out there because of the effect it has on space and time around it. So it's gravitationally affecting the universe, but it's not visible to us. Some people think it should be called invisible matter because uh, light passes right through it. It's literally invisible. It is not a scientific fact. In fact, Dr. Alfred Wildersmith, who had four earned doctorate degrees in the natural sciences and chemistry and biology and pharmacology and so forth, he simply wrote one time, he said, there is no such thing as an evolutionary science because evolution violates the most basic principle of science. That you have to have an empirical fact to begin your hypothesis with. And there is no empiricism here. It's all philosophy, it's all conjecture. It really comes down to how do we explain the universe without God? And they come up with a fairy tale and people believe it because people say it's people in white coats and mortarboard hats say this is the way it is. And don't you dare question it. Don't you dare say it's not true. And yet what it does is it creates a world where violence becomes not only justified, but even necessary in the minds of too many people. So as we look at our world, we say, how is it that the violence just seems to be increasing? How is it that so many pe young people are so disconnected and disengaged and so depressed and so anxious and so feel like purposelessness and meaninglessness in our life? And you sit there and go, how could they not? If you are raised from the cradle to believe that life has no purpose, it has no meaning, there is no design, it's just a random collision of various molecules and atoms that coalesce to create something or other, and that we're just halfway step, and when we die, we just go off the scene. When we realize that we are not the fittest, we are not the brightest, we are not the strongest, we're just one of the herd to be called out over time, how can you not become depressed, become depraved? How can you not just say, what difference does it make if I live or die? It leads first to depression. It, the idea of what is my life about? What does it mean? Now, I don't say this just offhandedly. I say, this was exactly the state of mind I came to before I became a Christian. As I looked at my life and thought, what difference does it make if I live to be 50 or if I die tomorrow? At the time I was 19 years of age. What difference does it make? Because if life has no meaning, no purpose, no design, no end, then what, what am I going to derive from it? We fall into that category that Paul spoke of when he said, they say, let us eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. So that you either try to just keep yourself entertained and amused to death, so you don't have to ever think about what's going on in the world, or else when you do think of it, you fall into such a meaningless depression of despondency that what happens is you end up wanting to just be dead. And that's really what happens. It's that, that first it begins with a depression, then it's followed with a, a certain depravity that as human behavior, behavior sinks into the most common denominator, which is simply the blatant, unabashed pursuit of personal happiness at the expense of everyone else. Like Dylan Klebold, who, who went into Columbine High School and shot up a bunch of his classmates. And in his journal, he just simply said, I am God, what I say goes, and if you don't like it, you die. Which, if you read his writings, is perfectly consistent with a nihilistic mindset that developed based upon the idea of evolutionary hypothesis. You see, the Bible creates a powerful contrast. Basically, its explanation of our existence is equally profound, but in the totally opposite direction. What it says is that we are created specifically and uniquely by a good God who had in mind a good purpose. But we are also created for nobility a noble purpose with a profound meaning. God has given each of us our unique place. When Paul speaks to the Corinthians about the body of Christ, and he says he's selected and chosen every one of us to fit precisely into that huge puzzle called the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ on the planet, and you are a piece that was made uniquely for that spot, and there is not another one in all the universe. If we believe that, suddenly life takes on a value and worth. Suddenly there's a purpose and a meaning 
and a destiny that we yearn to follow and to fulfill and seek. C.S. Lewis put it in his book, Weight of Glory, put it this way. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Then he says in contrast, nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. Why? Because they don't last. They will die with time. But it is the immortals whom we joke with and we work with and we marry and snub and exploit because they are headed for either immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Whether you go to heaven or hell, you are immortal. You are forever. There is no cessation of existence, only a dropping off of the carcass or the vehicle of the body, but the soul that is in you is created by God and it is eternal. And the real challenge of life is where will I spend that eternal? You see, every one of us has a need to feel productive, to feel like we're doing something. One of the reasons why I decided long ago that retirement in the uh, imagined sense of the American dream, you know, basically retire, play golf and fish all day, was because I'm a terrible golfer and I don't like fish that much. But the simple fact is I, I realize that a lot of those people die early because without a driving purpose behind your life, you're eventually going to fall into a depression and despair. We need to feel like we are making a difference, that we're contributing, that we're being productive with our life. So if you're an evolutionist and you say, well, I live a productive life, you don't know what you're talking about. You're living with a philosophical inconsistency that one day you'll have to confront and it will kill you. It's a sad thing because we live in an age where <clears throat> the gospel is being, its wings are being clipped. I, I guess the best way I could put it. We have more increasingly what's called the abbreviated gospel so that more and more we find that churches want to talk about the things that people want to hear. We want to talk about how much God loves us and the wonderful plan he has for our life, the destiny he has prepared for us and how, how, how special you are and in his eyes and all those sort of things. And we want to stay away from the other side, the darker side of things where he says that if people reject him, they'll go to hell. If they behave in certain ways or follow certain lifestyles, styles, they're not saved, they don't know God, and they also are going to hell. We don't want to do that. We want to kind of abbreviate it and clip the wings so it, it's something that's palatable and easy to deal with. We don't want to be troubled by those noisome things. And yet, one of the things he says is, my Father's glorified in, in you bringing forth much fruit. And if you bring forth no fruit, he, he just simply clips that branch off. When he talks about you and I, and this is where I think we, we as Christians really get into fault, when we talk about hatred. We can, in our politically charged world, I mean, it's, it's easy to become hateful or, or to be discordant or jealous and have fits of rage. Or I even think even as pastors, we can fall into a thing in the church of selfish ambition or dissensions and factions and envy or drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Again, Paul says, I warn you, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I read it again. I warn you, those who live like this, in other words, the defining characteristic of their lives are any of the above. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's why you, in, in, in some people's efforts to be so loving to other people who don't know the Lord, I think you are loving them right into hell because you aren't praying for them and you aren't loving, speaking the truth into their life. You don't have to be mean, you don't have to be rude, you don't have to be dis disrespectful, but you do have to say, listen friend, I love you and I care for you and that's why I'm going to tell you the truth. That if you continue to live like this, it will take you to hell. So the question I would try to <clears throat> bring this baby in for landing on how does one go about producing good fruit in our life? And I think the first step is to correctly identify what is good fruit. What is it? Paul gave us the short answer here in, in Galatians. He said the fruit of the Spirit is love. As my pastor so often pointed out, it's fruit singular. Is is a singular. It's not the fruits are. The fruit is. It's one singular thing. It's love. 
And that love manifests itself in your life by joy and by peace, as he goes on. And as we know that joy and that peace that comes from that love, we begin to interact with people on a different way. We interact with them with patience. We interact with them in kindness. We interact with them in goodness and in faithfulness, in gentleness and self-control. Those things are so powerful. But it means also that there's a kindness, that we are committed to actually being kind to other people, which is a rare commodity in our world anymore. 